Exactly how does someone become a biblical bonitarian? That's definitely a great question. Thankfully, we have a brother today who's going to share his testimony of how he did just that. Stay tuned. And welcome to the Biblical Bonitarian channel. My name is Mario. Today we will be hearing the testimony of a brother of ours, Brother Collier Ward. Collier will be sharing with us how he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but he would also be sharing with us how he became a Biblical Bonitarian. So we're very glad to have you on, Collier. Collier, welcome to the Biblical Bonitarian channel. Thank you, Mario. It's an honor to be here. Oh, no, thank you. Kali, let's begin first by uh, having you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, some things about yourself. Okay. Um, as, as we've already established, my name is Collier Ward. Um, I live in a town just north of Charlotte, North Carolina, in the United States. I'm an architect by profession. Um, I need to say that I'm a building architect, a registered architect. So many IT and software jobs have the title architect in them. One of those guys that designs buildings. Um, um, I'm married, met my wife in college. We have two grown children and three delightful grandchildren. That's me in a nutshell. Wow. You said three three grandchildren? Three grandchildren. Three oh, that's and a little sister. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds nice. Uh, I, 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 I'll assume that as you're a grandparent now, it's a different ball game than being uh, just a parent as you were before then, right? The old joke I've I often heard, and now I say it. Um, if I knew grandchildren were so so wonderful, I would have had them first. <laughs> now my kids are great, okay. but uh, the grandchildren are just a whole other class. Oh, great, great, great! I'm actually looking forward, forward to that. that. Not there yet, but uh, looking forward to that. That sounds great. What's waiting for? Let's let's begin by you basically tell us how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Um. I was saved as a small child. I was about six or seven. Can't remember the exact year, but um, um, I was saved in a backyard Bible school, sort of like a vacation Bible school in our in our neighborhood one summer. Um, my mom had told me before this that every time I did something wrong, I got a black spot on my heart. And she didn't tell me the remedy or she didn't let me know. The, I don't remember her telling me what the, what the remedy was. So I just thought, well, I better behave. I better keep this accumulation of black spots to a minimum. Um, so whether I knew it or whether she knew it or not, she was sort of laying down the law that you know, I was trying to live right. I was trying to, in my own power, do what was right and, and try to um, not accumulate too many black spots on my heart. Mm. And it didn't, it didn't crush me or anything, but I just thought that was the way it was. One time I got caught telling a lie and she knows, you know, it makes Jesus cry when you lie. <laughs> so I just, mm. At this thing, I just don't make God mad, you know. Kind of. But anyway, we were my brothers and I were at this uh, uh, backyard Bible school, and part of the thing was every day there was a, a short memory verse, and if you said it, you got a sticker or whatever. Standing in line, I'm getting ready to to do the verse. It was Psalm 51, 7, B, the end of the verse that says, "Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow." And so I had memorized it, and I was standing in line, and there was a little girl in front of me, and as I heard her say. You know, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing. And it was when I heard her say in her little girl voice, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. It hit me. The light came on. I realized that was the remedy for my stained heart. I could get rid of the spots. Jesus could heal me. So I rattled off the verse, got my sticker or whatever, but I couldn't wait to get home and tell my mom the good news. Jesus washed my spots away. <laughs> she was delighted. I, I, I don't know. I, she's passed away now. I don't, I'd love to talk to her and see what her memory of that was. But um, I remember going on a family walk that night and just so excited to starting life over. I was only seven, but I was, I was a new man. I, was, I had a clean record. So um, that's how I got to know, um, got to know the Lord. Um, well, my parents divorced a few years later, and my mom passed away when I was in high school, and there was a lot of other 
crazy tales uh, growing up. So I'm glad that the Lord got me and saved me when I was young. He was with me through all of those weird twists and turns. So I'm, I'm really glad he, he saved me at six or seven and not later in life. Amen, amen, amen. As you, as you look back on that time of, of growth, were, are there any things that stand out to you just in terms of memories that you have as you grew in your faith? Nothing particular. We um, we went to a, a Baptist church, and like I said, my parents were divorced, but we my father continued to take us to church, and mm. just both parents, even though they they fell apart as as a couple, they were both good parents. There was not a lot of dirty dealing. We they both respected each other in front of us kids, so it was a good as best as a broken home could be. It was good, and and the Lord was always there. Like I said, we continued church and new Bible for a birthday and that sort of thing. So it was a good good Christian home, even though it was maybe typical for some. The, the parents didn't stay together. Mm -hmm. Colin, let's let's expand upon that. So so obviously, you know, being saved uh, at a young age, as you said, uh, you know, you, you obviously uh, got a new heart at a young. At a young and, and God worked with your life throughout. Um, as you look back, how, how did you become a, a biblical bonitarian? What were some of the, the things that led to that? Okay, well, I, when I went to college, went to study architecture, um, didn't do the typical partying and drinking and carousing. I was there to study. And if I wasn't pulling an all-nighter in the design studio, which happened quite a bit, I was on a spiritual exploration. That's that's the trouble I got into. Went to all, <laughs> all types of... Um, you know, apartment prayer groups, campus ministries, home churches. And for me, the more zealous, the better. And that's the trouble I got into, just <laughs> pushing the trouble. envelope. Every, you know, who, whoever was the most bold and crazy, that's the ones I wanted to hang out with. Mm. Well, I mentioned that I met my wife in college. Uh, we married there. And um, oh, at wow. one point, the folks we were hanging out with, it was a small home church, we went to... Um, several churches and um, most of them were, um, as I recall, most of them were one that's Pentecostal. And that's yeah. a group that um, their holiness, they wear long sleeve shirts, the men, the women don't cut their hair, they, they wear long, they, it's a, like hanging out with the Amish or something. They looked different. Most Christians, you can't tell walking down the street, these people look different. They're very zealous and we enjoyed the fellowship, but they were, um, they were oneness. They were fiercely uh, monotheistic, I suppose would be the, but um, mm. growing up in the Baptist church, I had never heard anyone question or challenge the Trinity. And their yeah. refutation of the of the three person view was, was very, very, uh, I mean, it, put, it worked its way into every sermon. That, that was their brand, you know, that they were yeah. Trinitarian. So that opened up some, you know, that got me to thinking and to studying I was looking in my own private in my own quiet time with the lord i was reading and trying to piece this thing together well there's god's not three persons he's one but when i i couldn't get my head around the the modalism of it you know that god was the father and the, oh, the lord was god the father in the old testament was jesus in the gospels and then from the book of Acts on, it was the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, as they said. Um, mm. That just didn't make sense to me. And it seemed like the, the oneness doctrine had more holes in it than the Trinitarian doctrine. So I was sort of in the middle somewhere. Um, I remember uh, sitting with my pastor in small home church. We were on his front porch, just sitting there. We had our Bibles. Okay. And I was saying, you know, it seems like the Trinity, well, obviously the Trinitarians see three, the one to see one, but I see two in the scriptures. Wow. And I don't know what passages I was um, meditating on at the time. It was probably first John. Um, I mean, John 1, 1, in the beginning okay. was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's definitely two or one, that's not three. Yeah. <laughs> and also focusing on all of Paul's epistles, which began with grace and peace unto you uh, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They're very clearly two, not three. So again, I don't know what uh, what verse or what moment I came to believe, and I didn't know I didn't know till recently that there was a term for it. 
binitarian. Um, I just <laughs> sort of called it the Father and Son and Godhead. I just didn't know how to say it, but it was um, exclusive of a third person, the Holy Ghost. Now we were Pentecostals. We believed in the Holy Ghost. We spoke in tongues, believed in miracles, <laughs> and all that. So it was kind of odd for it to to be in that, but not see the Holy Ghost as a full separate person. And the standard description of the Trinity is, um, I, I hear Hank Hanegraaff's voice, uh, the Bible answer man, when I say this, for years listening to him, he would say that the um, Trinity, there were three co-equal persons and they had fully developed relationships among themselves. Mm. And in the Old Testament and the New, I see the Father and the Son referring to each other and, and fellowshipping with each other, but the Spirit was didn't hold that position. I couldn't find those verses. So, and this, this all of this happened in the um, mid, mid 80s, mid to late 80s. Uh, these ideas I formulated just sort of kept them to myself. You know, I just, um, I didn't know anyone else who believed it. I looked online and every once in a while I'd get into a discussion maybe with the Trinitarian online or something, but pretty much kept it to myself. It's only been recently, like discovering you, Mario, on the, on YouTube, that there are other people that believe what I believe, and there's a name for it. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen, and there, 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 there are many others. <laughs> yes, I, I believe there are. Yes. Just, Collier, just, just on that note, um, how did you handle maybe the case where you, you obviously talk about the case where you had with your pastor, where you were sitting on the porch, you obviously explained to him about you seeing two and not three. Uh, which, yeah, I'm assuming he definitely was glad you didn't say three, but I'm assuming that there was a little bit of, you know, hey, you know, why have you come up to the oneness side? What, 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 how have you handled in your, that your duration? How have you handled those who disagree or maybe those who have questioned you are as the conversation comes up or the situations arise? How has that been uh, from your end? How have you been able to handle that? Well, like I said, I've pretty much kept it to myself, but I do look for opportunities, especially if I'm in close fellowship with somebody. We have a couples Bible group. We go to all different churches and we meet. There's eight of us total. And when given an opportunity, we, we take turns either presenting a video or a Bible, a book we're reading. But when I get when it's my turn, I, I try to teach straight from the scriptures. Um, it's not mm -hmm. as much fun for them as watching a professional <laughs> video, but... It gets it off my chest. But anyway, one time I presented the idea that the Holy Spirit, like I was saying before, isn't in the same, uh, isn't a third entity in relationship with the Father and the Son as we see, obviously, that the Father and the Son are. Um, I just, you know, kind of glazed looks. Nobody seemed to get what I was talking about or why that was significant. One, one lady who was in the Bible college and was pretty sharp, she quoted the, uh, uh, I can't remember if it's which chapter in John it is, but where Jesus said, I'm going to send another comforter. She said right there, oh. it's Jesus saying another. So that makes the third. It kind of stumped me and I didn't want to argue. Um, so kind of left it there. Um, I have a friend online uh, that I know through LinkedIn. He's a fellow architect and we talk about those things and somehow it came up um, the same sort of thing. And I had thrown out some verses and he called it proof texting. And I didn't know what that meant exactly, but uh, <laughs> text from the Bible. That, but anyway, so I wrote down, I had a much more extensive list and I emailed him and said, mm. I don't know if this still qualifies as proof texting, but here, here's where I'm getting these ideas that the, the God has made up the father and the son. And we got into a fairly uh, cordial, very, Mm. It's just back and forth for a while. Then COVID struck. We haven't really followed up. He went from telling me, you're, you're silly, you're just proof texting, there's nothing there, to, wow, Collier, you're making me think. And he had a pretty good history, wow. better than I did. He had a better understanding of church history and the, and the uh, church fathers and all of that. He started naming people I didn't know of. And he said, well, so-and-so said this, but he never said what you're saying, you know. So he was trying to find someone in history that that taught this or or alluded to it and couldn't. And like I said, that uh, that discussion has kind of gone cold. But it was um, it was very mm -hmm. gracious. He obviously knew more about church history than I did and was willing to uh, engage me with it. But um, have been in any any uh, formal debates or exchanges at that level. It's just uh, just 
speaking with fellow Christians when they'll give me a chance and seem interested. Sometimes people just don't seem to get it or don't seem to care. Hmm. I, and I, I can I can relate to both ends of that spectrum. So, uh, you know, well said. Uh, and, and one of the things I like that you did is you went to the scriptures that it wasn't just simply uh, either philosophy or concepts or in uh, as great as church history is. Uh, I like the fact that you actually started out by going to the scriptures and that's what made them think. So, um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully you still have them thinking and uh, others along with them. But um, well said. Uh, do you have any favorite passages as a Bonitarian that you would, you know, obviously you mentioned the John 1 and 1 uh, earlier, but do you have any passage that kind of stand out to you as some of your favorite passages? I think my favorite currently, if you can, if you can list them that way. Um, <laughs> And I have, there have been a couple of occasions in talking to Trinitarians, and they always preface, whether it's in a, from a pulpit or, or whatever, they always preface it with, this is unknowable, God is unknowable, the Trinity can't be fully explained. We can look at, you know, physical representations of water as steam, ice, and, and liquid, but, you know, and that's one my mother told me when I was little. She was trying to explain the Trinity, and she used that one. And they... And they're, they're hung up on how it's impossible to know God, the, the Godhead, the nature of God. And I, and I quote from uh, John 17, 3, I think it is, where Jesus is praying in the garden. And he says, and this is eternal life, that they know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's not a mystery. It's that, that's the definition of eternal life, knowing God and knowing his son. And so that's, I think, my sort of key verse, if I had to start off a talk or something, I'd probably start with that, because that's how Jesus defined eternal life, knowing God and Jesus. And that's two, that's not three. You didn't, <laughs> there's no footnote of the Holy Ghost in there anywhere. Amen. Hey, that's a, that's a great one to start with, especially since it's uh, dealing with present and eternal destination. <laughs> and it's a and it's a prayer between the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. So I think you picked a winner there. That's a, definitely a great verse. And uh, I like that passage as well. Um, Collier, just, just to move things forward, um, obviously, if you had an opportunity, you, you're living in these current times as a Christian, if you had an opportunity to talk to, let's say, all the Christians, you know, throughout the land, what would you encourage them in terms of their walk with Christ? What would you, uh, you know, come alongside and exhort for them if you could do that? What I'm going to say is not very unique. Everybody, a lot of people say it, but it's something I'm learning anew, so it's, it's fresh. Um, the idea that if you're going to develop a relationship with anyone, a spouse, a child, a coworker, the way you do that is you spend quality time with them. And so I'm personally, being a new year and everything, I'm going back to um, the discipline of spending time with the Lord in a regular fashion, early morning, um, both in prayer and in Bible study. Um, I think those two are the, the, the hallmark of any strong relationship and strong walk with the Lord. Um, and coincidentally, as I say that, I realize that's the state I was in when I, mm. this binitarian idea to me. I was uh, very much wow. in the Word as, as a college student, as much as I could be, um, burdened in prayer. So um, I was in a place to receive that knowledge from the Lord then. And I, in all those many years later, I want to return to that. And the other advice I think I would give is... Um, to just turn off the world's media news mm -hmm. and the music and the movies and the commentary very little of it is edifying most of it draws you away from mm -hmm. true love so that's the other thing i've done i don't own a tv <laughs> wow good <laughs> I, can, I can pick things up on the internet if i want to if i gotta watch something but there's just so much time we mm -hmm. just just that say that people spend you know hours in front of the TV screen, and that just—it's uh, not—it's not beneficial. And I think it's across purposes; it, it, it deters mm. wanting to grow, grow in the Lord. So that would be my other bit of advice: turn off the TV. Hey, amen, and amen. Those are two great pieces of advice. Uh, I hear you loud and clearly on those, and uh, I can also testify that the uh, the more you spend time in God's Word and time with Him. Um, you know, you, you find yourself, that's, that's your default conversation. That's the person that you are drawn to and who you want to be with. And, um, and so, uh, I definitely, uh, second that, uh, that encouragement and, uh, especially with everything that's going on, it's, 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 you know, God is our refuge. Uh, and I find that the more time we spend with him, the stronger we are when we're engaging with other people that, uh, they can tell, like they said, the disciples, they can tell that we've been with Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Hey, Collier, thank you for sharing your testimony and your life and giving us just a, a glimpse of yourself um, as a person and as a monetarian, but most of all, as a Christian. Uh, may I pray for you as we uh, to wrap up this session? Um, thank you for, for this talk, and uh, by all means, let's pray. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, Collier. I thank you for his life, oh God. I thank you for him, even when he was a little child, oh Lord, that you brought him to Christ. And I thank you, Father, that you touched his heart. We learn in the scripture that no one comes to the Lord unless the Father draws him. And so, Father, we thank you that you drew him, as he said, at a young age, that prepared him for some challenges ahead. And I thank you, oh God, that the same faith that he embraced in, that Jesus cleanses our hearts and washes away our stains, is still true today. And I thank you, God, that you brought him through. Uh, and you've even taught him things in your word and you've matured him. And through questions and through other uh, avenues, he sought you out and he's known you. And so, Father, I pray for him, his family, his wife, his children, even his three grandchildren, oh God, that you would bless them abundantly. And I just pray, oh, Father, God, that you keep them and surround them, protect them from the enemy. And I pray, oh God, you would fill his heart with joy and also with the knowledge of the father and the son. And I just pray, oh God, that he would rejoice in the eternal life that he has through Christ. And I ask this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mario. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks.